I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live at our noontime poetry panel discussing Singing in the Dark, a global anthology of poetry under lockdown. Before we jump in, we want to sincerely thank all of you out there for joining us. Really grateful to our family of loyal customers for keeping our business spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this incredible anthology. Singing in the Dark, a global anthology of poetry under lockdown, brings together the finest of poetic responses to the coronavirus pandemic. More than 100 of the world's most poets reflect upon a crisis that has dramatically our lives and laid bare our vulnerability. The poems capture all of its dimensions, the of solitude, the unexpected transformation in the expression of interpersonal relationships, the even sharper visibility of the class divide, the marvelous revival of nature and the profound realization of transience of human existence. The moods vary from quiet contemplation and choking anguish to suppressed rage and cautious celebration in an anthology that serves as an aesthetic archive of a strange era in human history. I'd like to welcome editors Nishi Chala and Kay Sachidanadan, who will introduce our amazing panel of contributors. Thank you all and have fun. Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to our poetry reading from Singing in the Dark. It's always fascinating to read books on diseases and the cultural history of various kinds of epidemics. We are all aware that an insatiable fascination with contagious illness is hardwired in all of us. It was therefore even more fascinating and even somewhat challenging to compile an anthology that records various poetic responses to the malaise that presently surrounds us and that uh, has tightened its grip on us across the world. As a shared experience of <coughs> The resonances of a common and universal thread is a given. The existential crisis and the economic and political concerns that have shaped the personal responses of poets across countries reveals a common storyline, a common narrative, arc and flow. That is at the core of our anthology, Singing in the Dark. We have with us some well-recognized poets from across the globe, Stanley Barkin from New York, Amanda Bell from Ireland, Yorgos Polyaros from Greece, Max Garland from Wisconsin, Taslima Nasreen, a Bangladeshi writer, Barbara Oppenheimer and Diane Wilbur Parks from the Washington DC metro area, Amir Aur from Israel, K. Sachidanandan and Sudeep Sen from India, and Les Wicks from Australia. Very briefly, concerning the organizational structure for our program today, I will spend five minutes with each poet, requesting each poet to read his or her poem, as well as one poem from the anthology. Time permitting, I will try to engage them in a brief discussion mm -hmm. concerning the two poems. I plan on following an alphabetical order to bring each of the poets on board. I will read my own poems at the very end though. We begin with Stan Stanley H. Barkin, an American poet, translator, editor, and publisher of cross-cultural communications, which he founded in 1971. Stanley Barkin, will you please read your poem, Silent Dark? All right, Silent Dark. When even the early sun dreams are shrouded behind impenetrable clouds, the starless nights endure and morning comes without a light. Like blindsmen, we will stumble through the lampless streets beneath blackened windows opened without eyes to greet our open mouths, our seeking hands. The white of teeth cannot reflect when even moons are vanished from the sky. We will listen for a voice that will not speak. Shriek out in the silent dark for even an echo to resound within some hidden ear, muted in the stillness of a world etched 
into the gray of forgetfulness. Thank you, Stanley. You had requested that I should not engage you in a discussion concerning your own poem, but I cannot resist quoting from Friedrich uh, Nietzsche here. I'm a forest and a night of dark trees, but he who is not afraid of my darkness will find banks full of roses under my cypresses. And of course, as Anne Frank also said, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. And uh, please, can you read any one poem for our listeners? I know you would, you know, kind of something on darkness, perhaps. Well, I thought you wanted me to read the poem by someone else in yes. the anthology. Yes, yes. That I selected Dugu Wat Piongo's Dawn of Darkness. Wonderful. I know, I know, it threatens the common gestures of human bonding, the handshake, the hug, the shoulders we give each other to cry on, the neighborhood loneliness. Uh -oh. Sorry. Damn. Sorry, let's just start again. Dawn of Darkness by Ngugi Wationgo. I know, I know it threatens the common gestures of human bonding, the handshake, the hug, the shoulders we give each other to cry on, the neighborliness we take for granted so much that we often beat our breasts crowing about rugged individualism. Disdaining nature, pissing poison on it, even while claiming that property has all the legal rights of parenthood, murmuring gratitude for our shares and the gods of capital. Oh, how now I wish I could write poetry in English or in any and every language you speak. So I can share with you words that one Jiku, my Gikuyu mother used to tell me. Gatidi utakas atakia. No night is so dark that it will not end in dawn. Or simply put, every night ends with dawn. Gatidi atuku stukia. This darkness too will pass away. We shall meet again and again and talk about darkness and dawn, sing and laugh, maybe even hug nature and nurture locked in a green embrace, celebrating every pulsation of a common being rediscovered and cherished for real in the light of the darkness and the new dawn. Thank you, Mr. Barkin. Yes, uh, Negui Vakhyongo, he teaches at the University of California, uh, I think at Davis, and he does write in Gikuyu. But your uh, you know, reading somehow reminded me of what uh, Dylan Thomas once wrote. Poetry is what in a poem makes you laugh, cry, prickle, be silent, makes your toenails twinkle, makes you want to do this or that or nothing, makes you know that you are alone in the unknown world, that your bliss and suffering is forever shared and forever all your own. Our next poet uh, is Amanda Bell. Is Amanda Bell here, please? Well, I'll move on to uh, the next poet. Your goes Juliaris. He is a famous Greek poet, essayist, prose writer, and translator. He has been awarded the Academy of Athens Prize for his innovative writing and for his work in its entirety. Uh, over to Yogos Holiaris, please. Uh, thank you very much. Let me thank Nishi, who brought us together and is coordinating 
this is. Uh, let me thank politics and prose, which I recall vividly as an oasis from the years way back when I lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, thanks to Sarsi and uh, Nishi for the anthology. Thank they you. Together, a terrific work. Thank you. And of course, hello to all friends like Amir Orr and uh, others, all the new friends uh, here and following uh, Stanley now and Sudeep. And... So I'll, I'll read uh, nine lines of mine. Mm -hmm. we stayed there together with my friend, the American poet, David Mason. He moved from Colorado to Tasmania. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to avoid translating my own work. I changed it too much. Our deal with David and others who translate my work is assume I'm dead, feel free, and then I get back on their back and, and uh, suggest other things. Very, very short poems. Uh, one of them is from a longer sequence called Gramma, as in uh, the word means letter, as in letter of the alphabet and letter of correspondence. And uh, it's simply the letter Delta, Delta, don't. Mm -hmm. I don't write to you. I don't remember you. I don't forget. I do not destroy your letters. I do not want you to know where I am. I don't want you to ignore that I am away from you. In the next very short poem, what I know is what I do not know. What I know is what I do not know. If that which I have forgotten I constantly remember if every life reminds me of death, even if I don't know, as I do know how to keep alive the dead so that they can remember us. Now, um, um, I, I think it's both, um, inappropriate and unavoidable mm -hmm. to explain poems, um, especially ones you have written or pretend to have written or made a special uh, deal on the business lane with the muse or the muses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is uh, inappropriate to the extent uh, uh, the circularity and uh, incompleteness of talk uh, to which poetry seeks to bring closure mm -hmm. is, is a process in vain, which is the reason we feel such love and contempt for poets at the same time. Uh, unavoidable and inappropriate as it is, it is also unavoidable because the need uh, uh, derives from the fact people, humans, however we define ourselves, uh, we are talking animals. So we are engaged in this endless talk. And it seems to me that part of what poetry tries to do is not just or not only or not mainly add what is being said, is being talked about, but it involves a different mathematical uh, process which involves subtraction. I think poetry is, is akin to silence and it is a way that an attempt, an effort to teach us how to subtract. Enough said, I think. And uh, I should uh, move on. Uh, I have not received the volume, but I was fortunate to have uh, the poems of someone with whom we became uh, friends during a poetry festival a couple of years ago in Cyprus. Um, a a poet, poet from our region, from our neighborhood, Nazwan Darwis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly grateful to Nazwan because he was the first one who arranged for my poetry to be translated in, into 
Arabic into the Arab language, and then other translators followed later. In the poem, a bit longer of his, I'm going to read, is also appropriate uh, for this time of singing in the dark, for this time of uh, uh, when we must wear masks, except when we are on uh, a screen and then uh, we only wear the mask that is our face. But let me say no more and just read his poem called, titled, The Last Mask. I haven't found it yet, the writing that liberates, that I once grabbed hold of, floundering in those suburbs, the writing that resembles passion and youth and the delights of the flesh in the way it surprises. I haven't found it. And maybe I'll stop looking, for I'm busy with trifles. My knife is dull now and I'm pretending I have no time to sharpen it. Time put on its masks and called to me from behind the newborn in the cradle, the infant on all fours, the child's first steps, the stumbling adolescent, the misgivings of the youth and the growth, the grown man's despair. Time called to me from behind all the frail and aging promises when time has no more masks were. But now I've got to crawl and walk and stumble forward and chase down my misgivings and precede all the promises as I stretch myself out in the coffin. The last mask is in my hands and I must wear it now. And one of the things you see as it unfolds in the poem is that answer Oedipus gave when asked by the Sphinx, uh, the riddle, the ages old riddle about the child on all four and then standing up and then slowly moving, adding the third leg, a stick, and so on. A stick, perhaps, were it not for his mother's hairpin that Oedipus used to take his eyes out. As we sing in the dark, it's dark. Uh, we look forward to the light. We hope light does come, but uh, we do keep singing. This is what we do. This is what we must continue to do. And others will join us. Thank you. Thank you, Yorgos Holirus. Yes, of course, the mask as metaphor has a long history in Arab poetry and social commentary. Of course, the speaker's tone is a mixture of sadness, frustration, resignation about playing this game, so to say, and Darwish is one of the foremost contemporary Arabic language poets of this generation. His poetry, like his city of birth, Jerusalem, reveals a composite of histories, the people and the places they contain seems to possess, seem to possess undisclosed details and as uh, you know, readers uncover them piece by piece, they reveal a tapestry only Darwish could have woven. Of course, mask is a kind of symbol, but uh, you know, thank you so much. And uh, as Sylvia Plath uh, also wrote, and as you rightly point out, poetry, I feel, is a tyrannical discipline. You've got to go so far, so fast, in such a small space. You've got to burn away all the peripherals. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Max Garland, Professor Emeritus at University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and the former Poet Laureate of Wisconsin. Um, Max Garland, please. And will you read your poem first? Thank you. Thank you. And this, it's a great honor to be reading with all of you. This is one of the few Zoom events I've actually looked forward to. Social distancing. 
Say there came a pandemic, some news drunk virus set its hooks in us and only the sky for a nurse arced and empty and barely even blue and only the musical pulse and the several senses for consolation except for a stream of distant words like waves bearing the rush, curl, and foam of elsewhere arriving. The distant rhythm of others. To bridge the gap between head and heart, dark and day, fear and whatever it is one feels on the brink of when walking next to great waters. How the surf catches and releases the light and the waves and bones tremble like the distant cousins of constant thunder. We know salt tumbles eventually from ocean to body and back and forth. We know it takes ages to regather the shaken self into the good world again. I remember a ritual once where hundreds of tiny basket-like boats were lit and launched with prayers and flowers and misfortunes, ignited and cast out on the water. Until the bay was ablaze, a rocking constellation of human woe uttered in small tongues of flame. Until little by little, they drifted, burned, blinked out, and then it was just dark water again, and we all went home. Did our troubles never return? Were we really less burdened or better people? What I mean is, sometimes worry needs to be ignited, launched into words, if only to blaze a while among flotillas of sorrow we thought were ours alone. What I really mean, of course, is keep in touch. Even if you don't know what to say, especially if you don't know what to say. Kind words, fellow castaways. Mind-lit emergencies, a fingertip and tongue. Float this festival of downtime and distance. Repopulate the dark with your fledgling human light. Thank you. Uh, I read somewhere, it's the questions we can't answer that teach us the most. They teach us how to think. If you give a person an answer, all he or she gains is a little fact, but give them a question and they look for their own answers. Yes, of course, the pandemic has in some ways made us rethink the ethos of social distancing. The barriers that we've always adopted between each other makes us re-examine whether it's true that it is by our very separation that we live and know each other. Uh, so thank you for reading your poem uh, on social distancing. Max, will you please uh, read, uh, you know, you promised to read Sabine Pascarelli's poem, so over to you. Oh, sure, sure. 20 May, 2020. Poem by Sabine Pascarelli. I watch the behavior of the people on the street. A variety of stories lie hidden behind the protecting masks. Is this the end of trust? Eyes don't meet eyes. Hands pointing to the ground, empty of gestures. Feet moving in silence. The young woman working in the studio of an architect takes off her mask to greet me. How are you? Without waiting for my answer, she assures me of how well she is, eyes contradicting lips. Times are tough for so many, she adds. Her voice is a balance of fear and control. I wish I could say something of comfort as she walks away. Half down the street, 
and see her speak to someone else. Aimless love keeps us in its claws, I think. I don't know how this sentence comes to me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mary Oliver wrote that poetry is one of the ancient arts and it begins as it did all the fine arts within the original wilderness of the earth. Would you like to comment on the form and tone of, of uh, Sabine Pascarelli's poem, Professor Garland? One thing I liked about it is that you would not know unless you saw the poem, possibly that it's a sonnet, a loose one, but it has, um, it certainly has the couplet at the end. And I like the way that it wears its formality loosely. I also like the fact, and I think this is sort of what I discovered about my own poem as well, that mm -hmm. it, and, and as was implied by another reader earlier, um, all of this mention of masks, the, the beginning of this poem, for instance, the poem would have made sense without a pandemic. And the dilemma of social distancing and thinking that your suffering is yours alone um, existed long before and has only in some sense been amplified like a lot of other social fractures by the magnitude of the current um, pandemic, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max Garland. Uh, we have uh, Amanda Bell, who has just joined us. She's a well-recognized poetic voice from Ireland. She's an award-winning poet, author, editor, and writing mentor with many feathers in her cap. She's also an expert in traditional Japanese poetry forms. Congratulations, Amanda, for two new publications this year, Revolution and the Value of Cut Flowers. Amanda, I see that you use nature as a background in most of your poems. Would you say that you use nature in your poetry to make your readers think about human life? And all of the nature imagery in your poetry is like, you know, manipulating the five senses to control how we experience nature in your poetry and also how we understand and interpret your poems. Uh, over to Amanda, please. Thank you, Nishi, and apologies for my lateness. I was allowed to go out and I actually had car difficulties. So I'm terribly sorry to everybody. And thank you so much for including me in this anthology and, and in the reading. It's really lovely to see everybody. Um, so, and thank you for your very generous introduction as well. Um, no, I think nature comes into my poetry very naturally. It's certainly not something that I would use as a use consciously as a, a way to, to relate to people. As I am a gardener, I spend as much time as possible in the countryside and having had years of writing haiku, I think this is really the way that I relate to the world. And if other people, if that resonates with a reader, then that's, that's wonderful, but it's not it doesn't come up, it comes about the other way, if you know what I mean. So please, would you like to read one of your poems? Thank you, yes, I would like to read Bumblebees, Jeez. which again was based on a real life event where I uncovered a nest while in my garden. Bumblebees. There was no need to fret about the bees, their fragile nest unlidded as I pulled weeds beneath the apple tree, their squirming larvae naked to my gaze and to the sun. They watched me from the border while I hastily replaced the roof before returning to re-thread the fibres of their grassy home. In the cleared weeds, I see their entrance and their exit, how their flight paths sweep the garden in an arc stitching up the canvas of this space as if they could remake the world which lies in shreds around us. A dome moves as I watch it, the stretching of an inchoate form. 
when morning comes, it glistens with white dew. Thank you. Uh, that's just lovely. Uh, Amanda would also like to read uh, Jack Foley, uh, uh, his poem, After Nash. We all know Jack Foley is, a well no is well known for his performance poetry and his multi-voiced performances and poetic pieces on the West Coast. Uh, uh, so perhaps, you know, you could just read After Nash. Thank you. Thanks, Nishi. After Nash, darkness falls from the air, all things death will snare. Lungs may burst and fail, what is good turns stale. Lips you wished to kiss soon will turn amiss. Marilyn Monroe into death did go. A burden is the sky, I am sick, I must die. Lord have mercy on us. See the virus crown burn our cities down. Think of great New York, all is devil's work. Men are shut and banned, do not touch my hand. Touch may mean your death. Infected is the earth, infected is the sky. I am sick, I must die. Lord have mercy on us. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, it's lovely. Uh, Carl Sandburg wrote that, uh, you know, poetry is the journal of the sea animal living on land, wanting to fly in the air. Poetry is a search for syllables to shoot at the barriers of the unknown and the unknowable. And poetry is a phantom script telling how rainbows are made and why they go away. Well, uh, I was hoping our next uh, guest, I was actually looking forward to uh, listen to her, read her poet poems. Uh, our next poet was Taslima Nasreen, a Bangladeshi feminist author who now lives in India. Uh, she's well known for her controversial writings, but I don't think she's here. So is Sophia Naz uh, uh, here, uh, Sophia? Are you here? Would you like to read your poetry now? Yes, I am here. Let me introduce you to our readers. Let me just turn on my video. Hi. Sophia Naz is a bilingual poet, essayist, author, editor, and translator. She's been nominated twice for the Pushcart Prize in 2016 for creative nonfiction and in 2018 for poetry. Her work features in numerous literary journals and anthologies. Her poetry collections are Peripheries, 2015, Pontalism, 2017, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Date Palms, 2017. Her latest book, a biography of a mother titled Shehnaz, a tragic true tale of royalty, glamour, and heartbreak, Published, was published in 2019 from Penguin Random House. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you so much. Welcome. You're in California, right? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. And thank you to Politics and Prose and uh, Nishi and uh, Sachida for editing this amazing anthology. And I'm, I was on standby and I'm, I'm so glad that you did do this and, and included me. So my poem from the anthology is called Ghost. Just a moment, the old gods say, we are coming to lateness, silence, shadow shawled. Do you not see our symmetry scrawled in your mirror? Grave length, two hand spans wide while you pace, let us place our diadems so. Lost in your address, gods, rains making reliquary clot while you talk, oceans mouth fraught, thick spattle on mortuary walls, corridors of wasted youth. Tell me again how paradise was lost in a poisonous smile, 
infected blanket. I'm lying here, pinned to your story, gullible Gulliver, while Lilliput takes over. Is not sleep next of kin to death? Sing me a lullaby, gods, again from your mouths of stone. Thank you, thank you, uh, Sophia Naz. Uh, Plato said that we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when uh, people are afraid of the light. Uh, would you like to read another poem? Yes, I would. And this poem is uh, by Usha Akela mm -hmm. and it's called Caved, 7.8 billion. Mm -hmm. This one looks like a planet of red windmills whirring on a field of poppies, a wild corona of a star, heart of sunflower. This pretty thing is fanged, arsenal in death's stockpile. Small, unseen things are perfectly precise. Hanuman burnt the city of Lanka thus, eroding pride. The bush is bursting with red berries. Spring has slipped through the crevices, breathing green on the city. A musician plays his oud to the sky in himself. The trees are gravestones to the forgotten dead. The deer conglomerate, driven to community. More families staked by windows notice the heartbeat of nature. The camera has vertigo. It's a crazy arc leering on the hoarded splendor of one family. What madness was this to record and proudly share? Lines of bottles on the kitchen cabinetry, riddled with oil of bright urine hue, toilet rolls, bon bounties, tissues, food cans, a pantry full of debris for doomsday, this raid of the innards of stores, this back to basics, to Freud's id of fear and self first. Where do we send our unclaimed sorrow? The unlabeled debris of life, the racking cough of unprocessed wounds. There is no island to send them off, to be done, be free, like those lines of casket in dirt in Heart Island, where New York City is belching unclaimed bodies, its gut overflowing. The mind is like an abacus now, computing deaths on the Excel sheet of consciousness from the Spanish flu, 20 to 50 million, from the Black Plague, 50 million, from COVID. What black hole continues to gorge up souls or is it an empyrean of hopeful light? What joust happens in the universe's annals? Between what forces this unending play into and out of life? Where is that mighty being who once gave the song of life to a tremulous warrior's heart in the middle of battle? Each of us is a naive question, as we have always been, curved like an embryo, full stop. By death. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. This yes, poetry speaks to people more than ever with the accessibility of technology and social media. It's easy to share poetry and spread poetry across the internet, especially during times when people are longing to identify, uh, you know, with uh, their feelings of isolation, defeat, disappointment, and loneliness. I believe we poets are aware of what is going on in the world around us and take personal experiences to provide a lens to connect those to cultures from across the globe. Our next poet is Barbara Oppenheimer. She's an American poet and a retired social worker whose poetry reflects her interest in contemporary social problems, 
including the inequitable distribution of justice and income and healthcare. Her empathy for the underprivileged is evident in her poetry, which often involves the downtrodden and the mental ill. Over to you, Bonnie. Okay, my poem is called Defense. 50 years ago, they said, the bullet would have his name on it. They said, it might be his time to die. The man understands that war is history. This war, cruel, invasive, helpless victims multiply, cease to breathe, hospital beds emptied, refrigerated trucks lined up, ready for their cargo. In mud between buildings, the man crouches, molds wet dirt into ridges, forms a tiny staircase, each step perfectly level. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. Uh, C.S. Lewis once observed uh, in his book titled A Grief Observed, that no one ever told me that grief felt so much like fear. Barbara, uh, I think, you know, you, I would like you to read Athol Williams' poem, Between Summers. Please, over to you. Between Summers. The vine does not die between summers. It does not lie in the ground waiting for life to restart. Even in winter, the vine is awake to its heartbeat, every moment a gift. In winter, it clears out its shelves of leaves that have dried and fortifies the beams that holds up its branches. It strengthens the pumps that draw juice from the soil and reboots its machines that turn sunlight to fruit. Like summer, in winter, the vine continues to live, no matter the season. It is living, not waiting for life. Thank you. Would you like to comment on the poem by Arthur Williams, please? Uh, would you like yeah. to comment on his he is, message? Yes, thank you. Yeah. He is a splendid man. I looked him up and found out that he is a social activist mm -hmm. and a professor of social policy. Mm -hmm. And I see in his poem a, another poem about masks, that behind the mask of winter, behind that facade of barrenness, uh, life is burgeoning, that spring is coming. I, I think he is hopeful in this poem. Absolutely, and that reminds me of the British poet Shelley who wrote so much about hope and optimism. And he also wrote uh, Shelley, that's the British romantic poet Shelley. He also wrote, poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. Thank you so much for your thought provoking poetry, Barbara. We turn now to Amir Or, a very well regarded Israeli poet, novelist, and essayist whose works have been published in 45 languages. He has been recognized as a major voice in world literature. His poetry has won him national and international awards. Uh, Amir Or's uh, Poetry reveals a deep interest in old myths and remote cultures. Over to Amir. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to, to be part of the singing and not part of the darkness with all of you. But uh, in truth, uh, poetry is both. It's both uh, singing and uh, darkness. And the poem I would like uh, to read to you is uh, like Nishi said, uh, kind of a myth. It's based on a myth, even though it uh, refers also to modern world. And it ends up uh, with a prayer. It's a take, take off on the Lord's prayer. But let me read it first. 
the Orpheus prayer, death and yet more death, sand and more sand. We have stood in the square, hungry to be, and like mountain shadows, cover the city with pictures of a waking sleep. Was she there or wasn't she? A stranger in my body, able and yet unable, I tried the air. How many more years will we walk this dead sense? The mountain is glimpsed like a vision or a mirage. Sense move on underfoot like a memory with no beginning. And each place is every place. Does the way go up or down? Are you there behind my gaze? Is my gaze there ahead of me? Where have we come from? Alone, the two of us have crossed vast marshes on the slowly melting faces of the drowned. For years, we've been immortal. In the attic in Amsterdam, we saw terrible sorrow in the window. How much longer shall we walk between death and death, sand and sand? A new past give us, a new death give us. Give us this day, the life of the day. Thank you, Mr. R. Uh, I don't know why I'm suddenly reminded of the Japanese writer. I'm kind of, you know, a true devotee of Yukio Mishima, who committed Hira Harakiri and kind of stabbed himself, but I love him. And mm -hmm. his powerful words, perfect poetry, purity, sorry, perfect purity is possible if you turn your life into a line of poetry written with a splash of blood. Mr. Orr, your poetry investigates both human relationships and historical and cultural issues. And often your poems involve poetic masks through which your gaze focuses on the world in a, in a rather original and sometimes extraordinary manner. Uh, the poem you just read for us, the Orpheus Prayer, pictures the speaker in an endless journey across infernal landscapes of deserts, marshes, and death. Uh, we don't know if he's on the run or set out for some quest. This poem is clearly a singing in the dark, and it ends with a prayer. Is this the image of the artist at this time? Would you like to comment? Well, it definitely is. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I picked up uh, Orpheus, who is the very image of the artist, the singer. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also universal because we are all singing in this dark. And uh, he goes uh, his way with uh, some woman. We don't know who she is. If it, it can be a muse, it can be uh, a lover. And, uh, but it doesn't matter because in this uh, kind of uh, calamity time, in this kind of darkness, when you go, have to cross uh, all the underworld, uh, everything is at risk, everything that is dear to you. Mm -hmm. And this feeling that uh, we are uh, alive only in name in this kind of time when everything shrinks, uh, can happen again and again. I, you know, I, I put there uh, the attic in Amsterdam, which uh, for me is a memory of the Holocaust with mm -hmm. uh, Anna Frank hiding in the attic. Mm -hmm. But I haven't been there. I haven't been with Orpheus either, but mm -hmm. I've been there in both places. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the prayer in the end is also a prayer for all of us because mm -hmm. we want really the mm -hmm. life of the day mm -hmm. now. We don't live in the past. We don't live in the future. We want mm. to have a life now. Mm. Yes. yes, thank you so much. Yes, that was so lucidly explained. Would you like to read another poem, Amir Or? Uh, I'll read uh, a poem by uh, Norbert uh, Nora. Please, thank you. Uh, the title is Seeds of Distrust. Mm -hmm. The distance must be kept contactless community, closeness like forbidden thing, 
has been already banned. Day by day, seeds of distrust grow. They came so far to fertile ground. And finally, they will cover homes, streets, entire cities. No one will look beyond suspicion, trailer from life after the pestilence. Thank you, you read it so well and what an honor. I'm again reminded of uh, another quote by Yokio, Yukio Nishima, uh, you know, uh, well, I don't know I, why I kind of, you know, remember him. True beauty is something that attacks, overpowers, robs, and finally destroys. The words just come to my mind, uh, you know, regardless of their relevance to what you read from your own poem, of course, or, you know, the other poem that you read. But uh, thank you so much. I can and very much connect to this uh, words, Nishi. You, you. you have good intuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, what an honor, thank you. We turn next to our next poet, Diane Wilburn Parks. Diane Wilburn Parks is a visual poet and artist. She's written two poetry collections and a children's book. Diane is the founder of The Right Blend, a culturally diverse poetry circle. She was recognized as a 2020 Prince George's County Poet of Excellence. Over to you, Diane. Thank you, Nishi. Um, I am both grateful and honored to be a contributor in this anthology. The title of my poem from the book is Isolated Wings. We are snowed in in spring, listening to indulgence from the chirps of birds, fluttering feet and faces of sun-drenched homes rising, opening the gold of blue skies. The world props against windows and doors, wishing for wings and the songs of birds. For more than 40 days, we've been flying into windows with untrained wings, caged inside walls, inside oily fingerprints left on glass. I keep wiping the edges of you off, cleaning the traces of your wild baby's breath now marred with Lysol. April cringes inside its bloom, afraid to lurk beyond its curled tongue, leaflet buds. Windows listen for wind rushed poetic mewlings. The color of dance is a strong sun, wept in a brush of uncut grass and the husk of sycamore trees, sleeves of rice, bleed grain by grain. We eat sparingly. We see a man dancing in the center of the earth with meat skins, whistling sound like flutes. These isolated iridescent wings can't fly. Even fish feathers into water. Life is still a flutter. Paddled fins wade in waters that still flow and the mist of white clouds return blue. The world props against cheeks and chest. Windows lick the oily salt of our skin while fingers flap in and out of dreams. Unmasked words wish to be free again. With outstretched wings, we lift our opens point our perched bodies to the wind. We twist our cages and bend them back while the cageless man still dances in the feathers of his skin. Thank you, wonderful, Diane. Very briefly, would you like to comment on the religious iconography in the poem? Like what about the 40 days? Well, the 40 days for me was, it is spiritual and it is symbolic of the trials and um, the hardships that we had to learn. All of the, the references of, you know, flying into the window has everything to do with a, a new way of life, the hardships of the isolation and uh, just the fact that we were not able to socialize anymore and just living life newly. But yeah, just the trials and, and the hardships and the 40 days is representative. You know, 
I believe this poem wrote that in, not me. And uh, it's, 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 it's kind of amazing, the yes. 40 days. Yes, and to quote, we are not wounded so deeply when betrayed by the things we hope for as when betrayed by things we try our best to despise. In such betrayal comes the dagger in the back. How thought provoking of you, uh, Diane, to choose to read Deborah Emanuel's Silent Revolution next. Over to you, Diane. Silent Revolution. In the spaces between these words, first light blooms upon a mountain of shadow. All that is hidden floats to the surface, dying fish rising out of the ocean. All that was unsaid dangles in the air, a delicate mobile dancing into form. In solitude, resilience springs forth, a fountain which did not know itself. In the chasms between each sound, whole civilizations are found, birthing themselves from the rubble, peeling away bandages from forgotten fruit, striking matches for a new fire. A fragile world crumbles to become perfect circle. A star shines bright in a traffic void sky. From the silence, a single breath is drawn into the belly of the universe, releasing winds of revolution upon an unsuspecting earth. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'd love to uh, discuss the meaning of the poem with you at some other time, but you know we have a few more poets to go. Uh, thank you so much for uh, reading the two poems. Um, it's time now for me to reintroduce to you my co-editor, K. Sachidanandan. Uh, what an incredible journey, sir, with you. It was wonderful, both of us, you know, kind of uh, plunging into, you know, the anthology, collecting all of the uh, poems from all of these, you know, well-esteemed poets from across the globe. So yes, thank you for that positive journey, very positive journey. K. Sajidanandan is a noted Indian poet and critic writing in Malayalam and English a pioneer of modern poetry in Malayalam, a bilingual literary critic, playwright, editor, columnist, and translator. He is the former editor of the Indian Literary Journal, Indian Literature Journal, sorry, and the former secretary of Sahitya Academy, that's India's Academy of the Arts. Uh, over to uh, Sachidanandan. Uh, thank you, Nishi. Thank you, Nishi, for those kind words. Uh, uh, it was, uh, as you said, a very happy journey uh, to to discover poets and to discover the 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 variety of poems uh, mm -hmm. uh, being written by poets from uh, at least six continents that we could bring together in this collection. Yes. Um, I, I will uh, uh, here. I'll read uh, uh, my poem first. Uh, I have the three. I'm reading one. Um, uh, I, I would say one or two sentences about a poem which I would uh, mm. like to read now mm -hmm. uh, because I think uh, the pandemic uh, did teach us uh, several kinds of lessons, lessons about, of course, lessons about the body, about the mind, about economic resilience, mm -hmm. about the helplessness of power in certain times of crisis. But one of the most enduring moral lessons it taught us, I think, was uh, the necessity of humility. First, it reminded us of the transience, the momentariness of uh, our individual lives, mm -hmm. uh, something we tend to forget in our age of intense greed and our passion for possession. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, it also told us how ephemeral the existence of our species can be on our planet, mm -hmm. uh, that man is not the lord of the universe, mm -hmm. nature can imprison us anytime and teach us to live in harmony with other living beings, bees or plants. Mm -hmm. It is dangerous to pretend that we are the, the sole heirs uh, to the planet. Human history may be no more than a, uh, than a moment in the history of the Earth, even less in the evolution of the larger universe. 
uh, this needs not make us all pessimists. I'm not saying that, but may also instead it may persuade us to embrace life, enjoy its brevity, and celebrate its little joys, and uh, even dream of uh, another life, a, a second life. It is this impulse that uh, forced me to write a poem like the circle, uh, which uh, I am I am reading now. Not mm -hmm. a not a long poem, as you know. Yes. The circle. Mm -hmm. Joy is a narrow space between two sorrows, a space lit by the morning sun, where a sunflower is in bloom amidst fresh blades of grass that two people can hardly occupy, and maybe a pale butterfly too. You can dance there with movements and gestures possible in that narrow space and sing in a low voice, can even laugh mildly, tickling the baby sunlight. But there is little time. You know it too. The sun will soon grow harsh. Sorrows will excuse you from both sides. You may even get trapped there never able to get out. When the whole body bleeds, you may suspect that joy is but a snare. It is not all wrong, but you were able to see the flower and dance. But pain, it is eternal, and its space infinite, like the abyss that once trapped the earth. You will have to leave the earth to see there are stars even there. Who knows, your soul may fly across many light years to land in a star. It will gain a new body there. Then you will know joy is but a narrow space between two sorrows. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, looking at the cosmos, uh, you can see that everything moves in circles and is shaped in spheres without beginning or end. Uh, uh, and not naturally occurring straight lines exist in space, so to say. Uh, circle is the reflection of eternity. It has no beginning, it has no end. And if you put several circles over each other, then you get a spiral. And in many customs and spiritual beliefs, a circle represents the divine life force uh, or spirit that keeps our reality in motion. It's symbolic of vitality, holiness, completion, perfection. Uh, and it also, of course, uh, you know, represents evolution as a process of transformation from death to birth, ending and beginning, as a circle has no beginning and no end. Um, uh, Satyadanandan, please, could you read another poem for us? Yeah, I'll, I'll read a poem by the Peruvian poet, uh, Hilder Brando. Yes. Uh, this, uh, he, of course, uh, he's uh, one of the most established uh, modernist poets of uh, uh, Peru, who uh, yes. lives in uh, Lima and has been translated widely. Yes. Um, the poem is called Howling. Uh, I think it is a kind of scream of helplessness mm. of a person who knows whether it is he who is dying or someone else. A scream that merges with the howling of the indifferent ambulance, uh, which uh, he does not know uh, whether uh, uh, it's for him or for somebody else. It's called the howling. Mm -hmm. Howling. Introduce me into your arteries. What else I would like to be your blood, your delirium, your favorite song. Light up the river of tigers, derail, they knock us out. Already, I don't know if it is the ambulance, the one that goes through the deserted streets to help someone, to someone, or I am the one dying, Moriamando, to die living, to die loving. Those who are about to die call for Help, help, help. Tonight, 
that you will never forget the truth i just keep on howling oh oh and the ambulance like you without mercy he ignores me thank you thank you thank you there's a reason poets often say poetry saved my life for often the blank page is the only one listening to the soul's suffering the only one registering the story completely the only one receiving all softly and without condemnation there's there isn't any fear in existence itself or any uncertainty but living creates it uh, for clearly it is impossible to touch eternity and i'm quoting here it's it's clearly impossible to touch eternity with one hand and life with the other thank you sachidanandan we turn now to uh, sudeep sen poet translator artist and editor sudeep sen has been recognized as one of india's finest uh, younger poets sen has published more than a dozen collection of poetry including the lunar visitations and postmarked india uh sudeep sen over to you please read your own poem first thank you nishri and sachi for putting this beautiful uh, anthology together not only it's urgent it's expansive but um, on to top it all it's also very beautifully produced and designed which is such a thrill to see um thank you politics and prose it's lovely to revisit you i've been there live i've done a live reading there many many years ago it's lovely um i'll read one of the three poems that's in the anthology and this one is called speaking in silence and um this poem is actually like, like a jugal bandi a duet think of a cellist and a violinist playing together and um if you see the poem on the page there are there are uh, every fourth stanza is in italics and the stanza that is in italics are words of a friend uh, called fiona samson and it's from her book come down there were two books that were published last year during the lockdown and our books were launched virtually which was a very odd thing so here we were launching poetry virtually um and exchanging a, a dialogue through poetry and this poem was written early early in the early days of lockdown and is landscaped in delhi and in the borders of wales speaking in silence breath taking weather surrounds us in these dark times i can't find come down misreading your book title as calm down as if i'm seeking balance for us and others we love island climate can be promiscuous indian songbirds outside my study tweet pigs on your english downs grunt texting a common tongue come down as everything breaks off mid story tractor tracks a brick at the gate traces of the ones who left just this morning centuries ago it was centuries ago yet i know this place well we walked through this we walked together in the slurry and squelch in the coppice i picked a driftwood piece sculpt edged by wind water a paleolithic talisman i left on your rustic window perhaps it lies there still exactly there on the sunlit sill and water shakes old terrors loose you could take this with you your whole life now everything begins to move and everything stays where it is we speak in poetic phrases punctuated by dactyls and trochees inundating line breaks with half rhymes 
This is the only language left, our private renga, ancient codes dictating our syntax, not our accent. As the world pandemically wrestles with the dry heat of disease and pestilence, profiteers pry, pilfer, dry season in the heart, you have to pray, although you can't, but still the valves of the magnolia wrench themselves upwards. Marigold, magnolia, magnolia will bloom, nature will dance perennially, fine-tuned in its horror and beauty. It is we who do not heed its signs, understand its apostle conduct. We have long lived in lockdown, social distance in solitary silos, mutating metaphors spilling everywhere, defying state and statelessness. Flowers crowd out branches, they are holding dark air up. Everything is, and know it is, wild equinox. Everything to come hides its face among the shaking tongues. I'm certain we will continue walking together and alone now and in the life after. One's only guaranteed a lifetime at most. Our silent speech stretches like white, its colors radiating beyond the spectrum bandwidth, beyond its infrared ultraviolet, beyond infinite frequencies. Whether it is the chakra sacred signs or just human belief, time falls into another country, into another century where you come walking down with them into the future. They won't arrive at such tender right. It is this that brings us home to the light that vanishes and returns. Shall we return to Aleph's source, to Oxhead's hieroglyph, to Fountainhead's genesis? To a child on a rope swing? Are we on a robotic treadmill on a journey mapped out for us? Do we script our destiny unlike nature's rolling hill rains, unlike heat dust pestilence? For now, let us come down for calm, to pause, reflect, love. You were always here in the body's forethought, in its heft, heat, and juice, in the smile of a stranger who will never speak your name. Thank you, thank you, Sudeep Sen. Uh, as Joy Harjo, a US Poet Laureate wrote, when I began to listen to poetry, it's when I began to listen to the stones and I began to listen to what the clouds had to say and I began to listen to others. And I think most importantly for all of us, then you begin to learn and listen to the soul, the soul of yourself in here, which is also the soul of everyone else. Uh, you have uh, very kindly agreed to read Joy Harjo's poem, I Give You Back. You know, with that refrain throughout, haunting refrain throughout the poem, I release you, I give you up. You know, as if her people have no longer have a need for fear. Uh, over to you, Sudhi. Please do read for us uh, Joy Harjo's I Give You Back. Thank you. Um... I first encountered uh, Joy Harjo actually in Israel in the, at the Jerusalem Literature uh, Poetry Festival, which was uh, curated by uh, Yehuda Amikai. Mm -hmm. Several, many, many decades ago, this was also the place I first met Amir Rohr, um, 30, 40 years ago, who knows? <laughs> and Joy and I read at the time together, and it's a real treat to read this particular poem. The reason I chose this poem is partly because this particular poem, unlike many of the other poems in the anthology, uses the oratorical style. 
It's a sort of poem to be read out to a large mass of people, for people to be moved. So the same words and the same lines are repeated constantly uh, for effect as a refrain. I Give You Back by Joy Harjo. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. You're not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my house, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you, fear, because you hold these scenes in front of me, and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, I release you, I release you, I release you. I'm not afraid to be angry. I'm not afraid to rejoice. I'm not afraid to be black. I'm not afraid to be white. I'm not afraid to be hungry. I'm not afraid to be full. I'm not afraid to be hated. I'm not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved, fear. Oh, you've choked me, but I give you the leash. You've gutted me, but I give you the knife. You've devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You're not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears my voice, my belly, or in my heart, my heart, my heart, my heart. But come here, fear. I'm alive. And you are so afraid of dying. Thank you, thank you. Yes, in order to understand Native American literature, one has to skillfully situate it within the context of atrocities done unto you know, Native Americans. Uh, and these atrocities include killings, forced evictions, trauma, rape, lack of assimilation. And so historical and uh, cultural contexts are imperative for readers to help piece together a mosaic of suffering that Native Americans beautifully transform into their poetic and visual art. So if we had to, I had to personally kind of, you know, uh, cross a few hoops to get this particular poem by Joy Harjo, uh, uh, permission from not an anthology to get it published in our anthology. So sure enough, all of humanity has also experienced a deep sense of fear since the pandemic started. And as Plato has also observed, expose yourself to your deepest fear. After that, fear has no power and the fear of freedom shrinks and vanishes. You are free. Our next poet is Les Wix. Uh, well, we have two poets left, Les Wix and well, I, Nishi Chavla. C is kind of, you know, if you follow the alphabetical order then I'm kind of way ahead, but I thought I'll read my poetry after all the poets, but it's 4 a.m. in the morning and Les Wix has sent us a video recording of his poetry. Les Wix, very briefly to introduce our listeners to Les Wix. He's a very well-recognized Australian poet, publisher and critic. He has a long list of achievements in writing, publishing, and broadcasting. This includes the publication of 13 books of poetry. Um, Alan, will you please play the uh, recording of Leswick's poetry? Thank you. And hear it. Last week, my bicycle went off and eventually dropped me. I suppose it's somewhere in the world of words. Your 
thank you uh, uh, thank you all the poets i think like um, you know the beauty of live readings is amply uh, uh, testified here because uh, you know much as leswick's uh, poetry is revered and respected all over it's like you know we couldn't hear a word of his recording and our apologies uh, you know to all our listeners um, and that also reminds me of uh, margaret atwood um, she's brought out a, a collection of poems this year or rather last year she wrote that the genesis of a poem for me is usually a cluster of words the only good metaphor i can think of is a scientific one dipping a thread into a super saturated solution to induce crystal formation i don't think i solve problems in my poetry i think i uncover the problems uh, let me read my poem to you uh, inside myself the virus licks my torn soul guilt tripping me i sing a love song to it tempting the faint thump causing my heart to fissure its fatty lumps pretend i live on a moon of my own landing turn my flesh inside out listen to the chirping of birds amazed that so much beauty could still exist amid club like spikes that crush the breathing soul lavender storms that hit unfounded hopes cluster phylogenetically a pestilence that asks for enormous surcharges lethal as the protean cry of daggers stabbing me yet again quietly slithering out a warlike stratagem as birds orchestrate their cheerful songs to each other embraced in positive sense rna the hard truths that no flowers on our window sills would relive proteins that slice human voices sliced lungs pause then breathe when i follow its replication patterns somewhere a flood of tears ensue attached to a host receptor slyly pursuing a purpose driven path winter turns into stunned spring and yet the stalk of the spike molecule sticks digs deep within in codes hollow dreams hollowed out in the open fields the birds shriek with intense tormented sounds adopt a transmembrane like structure and more and more are rendered mute transfixed fear packaging signals of sliding down motionless companions that express a fear triggering viral particles spreading out binding domains of dazed displeasure disbelief a tissue culture receptors and proteins that inject so much a solar vision that gives me a new calm a prayer that sparks nuclear capsids of refined pleasure gone i struggle with myself again i'm teen times more thank you listeners uh, thank you politics and prose we are reminded of w h auden's famous quip about how poetry does not change anything about how poetry cannot stop wars poetry seems like a bruised bloated corpse amid the terrifying secretions of the infected victims of the virus and yet one can write and speak ad infinitum about the eternal truths and universal values that poetry evokes one can sing pains to the eloquence and power of the poetic pen we can rave about the wonderful tapestries of words that our poets have spun out of the existential crisis bred by an invisible virus the satirical moods that the virus evokes as a result of prolonged isolation the lament and nostalgia of a world order that has abandoned us suddenly and out of reckoning the poetic portraits of our ordinary lives rendered even more ordinary and out of depth the anguish and pain of loss 
as a result of the rising death toll rendered in memorable portraits. The redemptive power of verbal art, all of this reveals in simple terms, the moral responsibility and the ineffaceable power of poetry amid a widespread epidemic. We hope our book will be part of a global cultural memory and a global cultural history. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Politics in Prose. Thank you. Many thanks politics to our amazing panel joining us from across the world and our audience as well. Your patronage enable us to bring you the incredible program. And of course, we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. Please head over to politics-prose.com to check out our events calendar from the latest and greatest from us and from our shelves to yours. We hope you're out there safe, staying strong, and staying well read. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alan. Thank you, Amir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again. Yes.